Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today um, for today's presentation. We're going to, uh, uh, us here at Chromalox are, are going to have a, a walkthrough and kind of a discussion of uh, the decarbonization efforts in the oil and gas world. Uh, we got a, a fair amount of examples and explanation of what we're seeing in the market and um, who we have today to, to review and walk through this with us is uh, Dean Strauser. He's our, our business development manager for oil and gas, has 32 years plus experience in the in the market, knows, knows far more than I do, and, and it's uh, it, he's always got interesting insight into the market and the applications that go with that. And with Dean, we also have Thomas Kibito, who's the uh, sector sales engineer for oil and gas, and, and much like Dean, um, over 25 years experience in the same industry with the electric heating products that Chromalox has for everyone. And uh, I learned a lot from both of these guys. They're both located in in the uh, Houston, Texas area and have lived and breathed this world for a long time. So with that, Dean Thomas, I'm going to hand it off to you guys. OK, great. Appreciate that, Derek. Um, if we could uh, uh, go to the, to the next slide, please. Okay, so before we get started, let's begin with a brief history of Chromalox for those of you who are not familiar with our company. Uh, Chromalox was the first company to patent an electric resistance wire surrounded by an inner core with an outer metal sheath. So that, that patent was by Edwin Wiegand. Uh, metal strip heaters were used to heat rail cars in the old days, as you can see to the right. And since this time, we graduated into making tubular elements. Uh, also pictured were, are the tubular elements used for electric stove applications. And since we've been in business for over 104 years, uh, we really would like for customers to leverage our experience to assist you with your electrification and decarbonization efforts. And uh, also you can see here that uh, we are owned by Aspire Xarco based out of the UK since 2017 and we are uh, still headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay, so Chromalox offers uh, over the last 104 years uh, complete thermal management solutions for all types of applications uh, with th third party uh, in house testing capabilities and certifications. So, um, you know, we have our different uh, product uh, uh, sectors, if you would. One is component technologies with cartridge heaters, tubular heaters, temperature control, flexible heaters, uh, uh, power controls uh, that are used for the heaters, strip heaters, and also temperature sensors and other accessories. The component technologies you might find uh, typically uh, are used with end users, uh, with OEM equipment like uh, like uh, fryer machines for french fries, uh, things of that nature. We also have our industrial heaters and systems uh, division, which is a big part of, of Chromalox. Uh, this is uh, uses our tubular heater technology uh, to make immersion heaters, circulation heaters, which are basically uh, flange heaters inside of a ASME pipe body uh, or non-ASME pipe body. Uh, tank heating, heat transfer systems, we do package engineer systems, and then power control systems, air heaters for duct heating applications, and also electric uh, steam generators. Um, then there's our heat trace uh, products, uh, self-regulating cable. Uh, we do MI cable uh, for that. And also we offer all the, the controls and supervisory software that goes along with uh, thermal management for heat trace systems. And then of course, we, we do have our third party and in-house uh, testing capabilities. And, and Thomas, I wanted to ask you with your 25 year industry experience, I mean, what stands out to you about Chromalox? Uh, what stands out most to me, other than the, the wide breadth of all offerings you, you went through here really quickly, is our typically conservative approach in designing all of these products. And it's something that Chromalox will stand behind and, and, and it pretty much always does exactly what it's intended to do for many years uh, when, when all the right information is understood by everyone. Very good, thank you. Um, as far as our manufacturing footprint, you can see by the slide um, our different facilities. Uh, the ice and edge products are made in Ogden, Utah. Um, and then we have, of course, our headquarters in Pittsburgh. 
Uh, we have a facility in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, where we make the do some ICNS products and our component technologies. Um, Laverne, Tennessee, we have our heat trace uh, products are made and stocked there, uh, as well as our uh, power control panels uh, for the heat trace and for the IHNS systems are made there as well. We have a facility in Soissons, France. And then, of course, uh, heat trace facility in uh, Wuzhang, China. All right, so we're going to talk about, uh, next slide, please. We're going to talk about uh, what is an electric resistant uh, heating. Well, uh, b basically, it's the, the, this is the core component of, of our technology. So it's an inner resistance wire, as you can see in the, at the helically cord resistance wire. It's uh, inserted into a tube and it's surrounded with uh, magnesium oxide. Uh, magnesium, magnesium oxide is used because it has a dial, excellent dielectric strength. So, and, but, but it also has excellent uh, thermal conductivity properties. So the key to the life of electric heater element is to have the electric resistance wire run as, as cool as possible um, uh, at the inner, inner core. Once you, if you get high temperatures or you have magnesium oxide that is, uh, is not uh, compacted properly, it will ground out easily to the uh, metal sheet tubing as you see here. And <clears throat> with that metal sheet tubing, uh, inside of there, we make our cold pin and termination. And uh, this is this is the same technology we basically um, uh, use for all of our tubular element uh, applications. Um, and then on the other side is we also offer medium voltage uh, technology. And this is the same core concept as our low voltage, but we apply voltages from 1,000 volts up to 7,200 VAC without the use of a transformer. And that technology is called Direct Connect. So this is the difference between on the left side, you see low voltage on the right is medium voltage. So as, as of course, we, we go up the voltages for low voltage up to 1,000 volts, but that typically uh, stops around 690 volt. Um, as opposed to medium voltage is 1,000 to 7,200. Uh, the efficiencies for uh, low voltage and medium voltage are a little bit different, as you, uh, but as we can tell here, uh, these, both these electric resistance uh, uh, technologies are almost 100% um, efficient. So the, the, big, the big takeaway on the medium voltage that I'd like for everybody to have is the fact that uh, using medium voltage reduces uh, the amperage demand. And in the case here with the case study, you can see that on an example with the uh, at 380 volt at 3,230 kW, that's that, uh, at three phase, that's 4,900 amps. That's a total of 63 circuits that are going to be used if, you're, if the customer wants to use 380 volt. As, to, as opposed to our direct connect uh, technology at 6,600 volts, uh, you're going to be drawing 280 amps, and that's only three circuits. So using medium voltage eliminates 60 circuits worth of wire, contact, fusing, and installation labor. This is a, a huge savings uh, when comparing low voltage to medium voltage, and typically the cutoff um, for uh, from a cost standpoint for medium voltage uh, versus low voltage is you're probably around one megawatt. So that's where you need to take a serious look at, at going with the direct connect medium voltage uh, technology from a cost saving standpoint. Um, all right, next slide, please. Actually, if I could interject two little things on that slide before we move on. When you look at those efficiencies, and since this is a, a, a webinar about decarbonization, uh, you're not gonna get any anywhere close to these efficiencies and, and even the best fuel fired, uh, fossil fuel fired uh, heaters, um, you, you might be getting like 80% efficiency when it's brand new, not, not once it gets dirty, et cetera. And the other thing to remember is uh, that one megawatt, uh, we get into multi megawatts. So don't just, you know, think electric's not a, uh, 
a viable option for you know multi megawatt you know 10 million btus an hour type heaters and stuff dean's gonna uh, get into that more a little bit later thanks dean yep thank you tom all right so what exactly is zero emission heat energy well basically it's decarbonization and decarbonization is uh the reduction in carbon intensity of worldwide energy uh to reduce global warming um there's there's two types of of it actually there's three types of co2 uh emissions but we're going to be concentrating on uh on the two types and this is scope one and scope two uh scope one emissions is co2 emissions located uh or emissions located at the plant or the facility uh, those are direct emissions uh, through the production cycle at, um, at the individual plant um, and or uh, production site. Uh, scope 2 emissions, these are indirect emissions uh, from the generation of third party purchased uh, supplied steam, heat or cooling uh, used at the manufacturing facility. So um, in saying that, uh, oil and gas companies are under pressure from investors, governments, and, and the public to create and implement uh, ESG strategies, otherwise known as environmental, social, and governance. Um, you know, Chromalox is trying to impact the industry in small ways and big ways in order to assist customers with electric electrification and and, uh, and decarbonization. Uh, a lot of the uh, you know, environmental engineers, sustainability engineers, other type people are contacting uh, Chromox because they're really not sure how to decarbonize. Like Thomas was saying, getting away from fossil fuel to heaters uh, for large uh, uh, megawatt applications or large BTUs. So as far as, you know, Chromox, um, when we look at when we look at uh, different systems, when evaluating the cost of large systems, it's important to consider the total uh, ownership cost. And Chromelox can help you with this. It's just not the capital equipment cost we're looking at. Um, and uh, we'll talk about this more more depth in depth at a later time. But these are other factors we need to look at uh, that we hope the customers look at. And this is what we can we can do uh, cost comparison for it um, with some of our uh, our calculator tools uh if you decide to contact us or we contact you um you got to look at the 99 uh there's no flu stack losses our heaters are 99 per, uh, percent efficient like thomas is alluding to we have uh, minimal maintenance uh reduced heater footprint um we can also utilize low cost uh, electricity generated by renewable energy sources uh, that also takes away the scope two as well um, there are zero, absolutely zero on-site emissions uh, for electric heating. There's uh, no need for uh, emission control systems um, and all gas-fired uh, large heating systems re require emission control systems. And there's absolutely no environmental permitting required for electric uh, process heaters. And something is, else uh, that comes up every once in a while is uh, you can put electric heaters in uh, hazardous areas they are certified to operate safely in hazardous areas and we will manufacture them to meet those certifications so you don't have to for example pipe uh, all the way out you know a couple of hundred feet away from where you need the heat because you have a fired heater and then pipe it back the product back you know adding uh, losses to the system etc and costs to the project Yes. Yeah, so as as uh, as we were saying uh, previously, that it's important that when we look at trying to compare fossil fuels versus electric, that we really do a true analysis of the total operating cost. It's just not capital equipment versus capital equipment. So uh, if we look at thermal conversion efficiencies, operational uh, efficiencies, maintenance costs, production downtime. Um, and then also the emission cost. There's good, there are uh, customers out there that are <clears throat> subject to cap and trade and carbon taxes. So that's another uh, cost that needs to be factored in as, as well. Um, Thomas, you have uh, want to add anything regarding this as well? Yeah, I'd like to say um, 
Promolox in general, uh, we have kind of an extra layer of customer support in the uh, both in the MSSEs like myself and the BD guys like Dean. Uh, we can do a lot of uh, little work helping helping you guys out, you customers uh, that go in, into getting a detailed quote, just giving you the economic evaluation information you might need to determine uh, what approach to go before you prepare your bid packages and all of that type of stuff. So so we'll, we can support you from, you know, the first thought of it being even the option all the way through the project completion. Great point. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, OK, here's an example of a cap and trade carbon taxes for uh, areas of the, uh, the globe, really, that um, do have carbon taxes. So as you can see here that uh, gas fired boilers or gas fired equipment emit 465 tons of CO2 per 1 million BTU hour, BTU an hour per year. So that's quite a bit. So um, taking an example here uh, at $25 per ton of CO2, that's 11,625 million BTU an hour. So depending on uh, which country or state you live within, the, the world uh, electrification can have impactful, impactful financial results. So um, the other thing, too, is um, if your facility is already at the maximum uh, CO2 emission, um, electric heat is a viable option if, if you do need some uh, process heating at your facility or you need to expand. So that will actually allow you not to exceed your permits, which that can get very costly when you do actually uh, have more emissions than you're supposed to. You're going to get fines and whatnot, but also it allow you to get your uh, equipment uh, and your plant going with electric heat will allow you get to achieve your permitting a lot faster than if you wanted to use gas fired. Okay, now we're going to uh, talk about some of the applications uh, for uh, electric heaters uh, that are used to uh, replace, uh, supplement, or decentralize from uh, gas fired heaters. So, Chromalox is already using uh, is already using products to successfully uh, decarbonize. Uh, we work with customers on an everyday basis. We require reliability and robust designs for demanding applications. Uh, some of these examples you see above here, um, and we're going to get into some of these uh, applications later to, to with with exact examples where these heaters are being applied. Uh, these app uh, these heaters are available with low voltage and and medium voltage uh, Chromalox products. Um, and Chromalox heaters are used for processes that were previously considered only for fossil fuel fired equipment. Okay, so we'll get into some upstream applications here. Um, as you can see, um, we'll start at the wellhead, which is on the left hand side, and then we'll uh, We'll move into the production areas. Okay, one of the applications that is is a great candidate for uh, electric uh, heaters is the is the uh, heater treaters, and we have customers that are already changing or retrofitting equipment in the field now. Uh, it's, they're replacing fire tubes with the electric immersion heaters. Uh, we can also provide indirect heating of the fire tube via heat transfer fluid, water glycol, or water. And we, uh, you're looking at pressures less than 150 psig, temperatures less than two, 200. So the big point here is fire tubes can be retrofitted to add electric heaters. And just to tag on to that, it's a really easy and quick swap out basically unbolt the flange or, or the, the, the opening where the uh, fire tube is inserted and put a bundle or sometimes just put the bundle inside of the fire tube and seal up the exhaust if uh, depending on the design and the duty. Uh, 
Another application is the glycol reboiler, or also known as the glycol dehydration unit. Uh, this removes water vapor from gas streams, prevents the uh, formation of hydrates inside the uh, gas, uh, prevents corrosion uh, within uh, in the pipelines, uh, and also protects equipment uh, uh, downstream, uh, uh, further downstream uh, that's processing the equipment. Uh, or sorry, pr it protects processing equipment further downstream. Um, it's also critical to have de dehydrated gas is to meet uh, pipeline and process specifications. A lot of times on these uh, on tariffs, uh, you know, the poor the quality of gas, the less money that the uh, the company is going to make because the because the quality is is not as high. So. Um, as far as in this particular application on the next slide, on the next slide here, okay, great. All right, sorry, I was having a little technical glitch on my side. Um, this we can actually retrofit um, the glycol reboilers as well. Uh, many owners and operators will continue to add inefficient retrofits onto existing gas fired heaters, uh, which also adds to their uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, owners might not know that the Chromalox electric heat technology is a viable alternative and requires min minimal retrofitting or of existing, existing equipment, just like Thomas had spoke to about. Um, if you electrify one, two million BTU an hour, hour gas fired reboiler, you can eliminate 930 tons of CO2 a year. Then also you could uh, use the gas that you're using to, uh, uh, as the source of fuel for, for the glycol heater, you can, you can sell it instead of burn it. All right, another application we have here is for amine reboilers, amine regeneration units. Uh, these are also called uh, gas sweetening units, acid gas removal. Uh, amines absorb the H2S and the CO2 from the gases, again, protecting uh, pipeline processes and the quality of the gas to the customer. Uh, the amines heated via reboiler uh, releases the gases, but the amine has to be recovered. So when the amines recover, that's where they require the reboilers where electric heaters can be used. Uh, amine reboilers and processes that utilize amine are excellent candidates for electric process heating. As we see here, um, you know, again, uh, a lot of the owners and operators, when they think of uh, reboiling applications, uh, they think of gas fired heaters. And when they think of gas fired, it's going to add to the greenhouse gas emissions. So. Uh, definitely Chromalox electric heaters are a viable solution for either directly heating amine process or indirectly heating amine process using, um, and what I mean by indirectly heating, you can use electric steam generators or boilers and electric heat transfer systems as well. And like Thomas said earlier, you can locate the electric heaters in the, uh, hazardous location without a, without any issues. Something else to point out real quick before you move on, Dean, excuse me. Uh, Chromalox, we, we, we're not necessarily building uh, amine units, glycol dehydrators, TEG units, etc., heater treaters, but, but we go back decades with our heaters being used in those types of systems by by packagers and end users, et cetera, over the years. So we do have experience in a lot of these, but but we'll, you won't see on our website, you know, a, an, an electric version of a, you know, reboiler or a, or a um, heater treater, et cetera, because we, we're just adding our expertise to the people with the process expertise, building the, the bigger systems. Yeah, Thomas, and, and that's a great point. Um, you know, you know, Chromalox continues to be a trusted partner for over 100 plus years and providing cost effective and reliable design designs that, and, and, and rugged designs that we that we stand behind. 
Um, these designs uh, create sustainable zero emission thermal management systems uh, for companies to meet their ESG goals. Um, in this particular uh, industry here, um, you know, from the wellhead to the uh, to the midstream sector, where they're actually taking the um, the gas and the oil and they're transporting it and gathering it and and they're and they're treating it. So we're going to talk a little bit here about the midstream side of uh, side of things now. One of the big things for the midstream uh, sector is gas processing. So the gas and gas processing, the natural gas liquids, there's a lot of, there's quite a bit of natural gas uh, fractionation. Uh, so each, once the NGL is, uh, had been removed from the natural gas stream, they're broken down into, into base components. And within this fractionation, uh, in these stages, it can you have to boil off the hydrocarbons within a distillation column. So these distillation columns all have reboilers. Um, as you can see here, um, we call them deethanizers, de depropanizers. I mean, basically, we're separating the ethani, uh, ethane from the NGL, separating the propane uh, as well as as the butanes. So. Um, in this case, we're boiling off the heavies to re-inject into the pipeline for further processing downstream. Uh, to the right is a list of all the NGL feedstocks. Um, and electric heaters are definitely a viable alternative to gas-fired reboilers for NGL processes that require uh, vaporization, either heating indirectly directly, we do have a viable solution for you. Here we have an example here that uh, on the right hand side, this customer is using a uh, gas fired heater to heat up a heat transfer fluid. That heat transfer fluid, which is uh, uh, is piped over to the uh, scaling tube uh, reboiler, which is at the base of the distillation column. Um, if you notice, the gas-fired heater is located outside of a hazardous area, so you have to incur, uh, you know, additional piping costs. Um, you know, electric heaters are used to de decentralize from existing API gas-fired heating systems. In this case, instead of running all that piping, you can actually have a uh, an electric heater right at the base of the distillation column without having, uh, again, the the hot oil heater off off to the uh, side or, or operating several different uh, reboiler columns. Um, we provide, that's called point of use electric heating. Uh, we can also, uh, existing reboilers can be retrofitted to, um, to uh, considered to be retrofitted for an electric heater. Uh, we could also supply su supplemental heat in, in case your processes are changing and you require more heat. Well, instead of uh, bumping up to uh, or increasing the size of your existing uh, hot oil heaters uh, with a retrofit or an additional hot oil heater, which will increase your emissions and require you have to get permitting, then electric should be definitely should be, should be considered to, to supplement that heat with a zero emission um, alternative. Uh, generally speaking, we have low pressures of less than 300 PSIG, temperature ranges from 250 to 300. And the other alternative here, too, is to use a uh, steam generator, electric steam generator versus a, a gas-fired steam generator. Or if you want to electrify the situation as well, just, just get rid of the, uh, remove the uh, gas-fired unit and go with uh, a, a steam, uh, electric steam solution. And electric heaters um, with with SCR thyristor control afford you you know 90% turn down in most flow conditions, and 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 you only need to put the heat input you, you need at the time. You don't have to have a, a you know five million BTU burner running if you only really need one million BTU or half a million for the moment. Uh, the electric heater can do zero to 100% modulation of heat output into the process.
that's exactly right, Thomas. And and you know what's interesting, every a lot of what we've been talking about um, are for larger applications, right? Um, you know, you're talking about a, a gas-fired hot oil heater or or a gas-fired reboiler uh, glycol regen unit. Um, you know, that could get into the higher BTUs. Um, you know. Uh, you know, we're targeting anything, you know, around t 10 megawatt and lower. Uh, that's where we feel like we, you know, Chromelox has a definite advantage. Doesn't mean we can't look at at, at, at higher KWs as well, but um, 10 megawatt and lower seems to be a, a, a good spot for um, electric heaters uh, from a sizing standpoint and, and cost standpoint. Uh, but again, we, we can increase um, up to uh, larger sizes as well. So, Again, we were talking about, you know, large BTU applications. Well, you know, there's also a way to decarbonize with small by making small impacts. And one of the small impacts is with tank heating. Uh, Chromalox has an excellent product offering for tank heating. You know, all facilities require some type of storage for liquids and gases, which require thermal temperature management when being transported and stored. These are great applications to decarbonize and make small impacts. If you own or operate several facilities, the small impacts can add up when talking about greenhouse gas emission reductions. So decentralizing from larger fossil fuel fired heaters to point of use tank heating or pipe heating will be more efficient and save costs while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see here all the different types of tank heaters that we do offer. Um, and also we offer our heat trace solutions for pipe maintenance and uh, tank maintenance temperatures. Uh, up to the right, uh, there's a it shows an API 560 hot oil heater that is used to heat up several different storage tanks. Um, in this case, if the customer is it has a tank battery of say 10 tanks but they're only using five of those tanks out of that battery to store product then they're re they're circulating they're using the btus on this heater to its 100 percent capacity just for five tanks with electric heating you can have point of use heating to and that will re definitely reduce your your uh, energy consumption from a cost standpoint but you will also not be emitting all that CO2 uh, for the process. And that, that's actually depending, again, depending on where you are, that could be pretty costly uh, for that. So there's some really good uh, efficiency values in electric uh, point of use tank heating. And also uh, working with the market specialists like Dean or myself, uh, we're gonna we're gonna work with the best solution for your particular application, whether it's you know like he mentioned our various facilities, whether it's some small heaters from Mexico or heat tracing from Tennessee, uh, large heaters from Utah, or or whatever the best combination of all the above is to to get you the the heat you need and the tanks you need. Yep. Whether you are heating tanks directly or indirectly, we do have a solution. In this particular case, this is a cell and tube uh, 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 bundle uh, that gets uh, directly, you know, immersed into the storage tank. So we could flow uh, heat transfer fluid from there or or steam through the, through those tubes if you have an existing. So uh, <clears throat> the point is that you can decentralize. Uh, from or supplement existing inefficient fuel fire heaters with electric point, point of use heaters. Uh, and most, you know, a lot of these facilities, they're, they're older and some of the, they have older uh, fossil fuel fired uh, terminal heaters and they're not necessarily designed for uh, efficiency, high efficiency. They were designed for function. So that might be something you could look at as well is uh, if you do have uh, an older uh, Gas-fired uh, heating system is 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 definitely look at electric as an as an alternate. The Chromalox we do offer pre-designed heat transfer systems for those companies looking to make small emission reductions in a short amount of time, 
As you can see here, these systems here, these are tank heating, but this is indirect tank heating through coils. So this is one of the many applications that we already have uh, uh, pre-designed product uh, and with, with short uh, turnaround times. Another uh, small impact you can make is with the tank heating is with direct immersion. So uh, decentralizing heating from larger sources as, uh, of fossil fuel fire heaters, like we spoke about before, to electric heating can improve efficiency while making small decarb impacts that could add up to significant impacts uh, if you're adding up and, and changing out to electric heaters uh, over several facilities. Uh, this picture here shows our different uh, direct immersion heaters. Also, we have indirect uh, immersion heaters with our LTF-X designs to where uh, once the heater is inserted into the tank, um, you do, if the heater were to have a problem, you do not have to remove the heater. You simply just remove the electric, uh, shown on the left side, the electric uh, coil element out. So the actual heater uh, tubes stay within the process without the, without uh, having to drain the tank. And that's a big uh, seller uh, and, and option for uh, our customers. You know, another small impact is our electric key trace. Um, and Thomas, Thomas is gonna talk a little bit more about, you know, how this particular uh, slide is uh, pertains to uh, better control of heat trace. Yeah, typically in like a uh, freeze protection type scenario, um, heat, heater, uh, the whole multiple circuits that so you can have up to 72 circuits being switched off and on based on uh, the ambient temperature to, to turn off or on um, all of that heat tracing. Well, uh, one way to to really save a lot of energy and it's part of a bunch of initiatives in many states is uh is to simply just replace the power connection boxes with uh one of our dts controllers the dts has uh control based in it uh you know reads the temperature and switches the power etc and, and what that allows you to do is if uh you know instead of switching all 72 if uh 50 of them are uh indoors in the shade you know or, or outdoors in the sun etc it's going to switch each circuit off and on individually as needed uh whether it could be you know line sensing even to maintain the temperature of the pipe uh no matter what the ambient you know temperature is but but this provides a lot of energy savings in a very simple elegant solution and allowing you to switch each circuit individually only by having a smarter power box for that circuit. And this is uh, this is often uh, part of a lot of rebate programs in many regions uh, when you optimize your consumption. So something to keep in mind. Okay, in summary, there are many oil and gas processes, transport and storage applications that require heat either directly or indirectly. Chromalox has zero emission heat energy electric solutions available today. Whether your application is large or small, Chromalox can, can help you. I, yep, Derek, I think uh, we're done with, uh, with the presentation part. We're happy to, to take any questions that might have come in or or to talk about any of the slides in, in detail or or retrofitting or replacing retrofitting or supplementing uh, gas fired heating with the with the electric heaters. Okay, excellent. Uh, thanks, Dean. Thanks, Thomas. Um, yeah, I have, uh, there's a couple questions I guess sent in. So yeah, uh, probably more, more discussion points, uh, at least the way the questions are worded. So uh, several times mentioned throughout the presentation, you mentioned hazardous areas. Can you clarify i mean is that class division when you say hazardous can you define that sure we can build heaters for uh class one div one areas uh controls as well provided the the duty small enough for the control panels because we're limited 
from an enclosure standpoint, but but we could wire the controls uh, part of it in a safe area to a heater in the hazardous area. And then um, class one div two is very, very common um, for, for us as far as heaters and controls. And we do have all the third party certifications behind all of that stuff. So there really isn't a limitation out there electrically. Not really, not really. I mean, a uh, five megawatt heater in a class one div one area. Yeah, we probably can't do that control panel, but but uh, the rest of you know, for far and wide applications, definitely. Nice, nice. Uh, and also, uh, Thomas, you mentioned earlier and I, Dean a few times too about the efficiency of electric heaters and, and obviously the purpose of this car, this presentation is <laughs> retrofitting, we'll say gas fired uh, systems in decarbonization efforts. Uh, the question uh, basically reads, uh, the, the efficiency of the electric heater is, as, as such being so efficient, is, is that factored into the retrofit design? Like how does that impact it? Is, is, it, is it different? Is it a one-to-one? -one? No, you yeah. end up saving. Uh, oh, go ahead, Dean. Well, I was just going to uh, point out, and I'm sure Thomas, you can please add on. Um, you know, a lot of these gas fired uh, heating systems, um, because of their some of their inherent inefficiencies, especially the older units, um, they're they're sometimes oversized. Okay, so the fact that when we you know go to look at the um, if you're looking at uh, retrofitting or changing out then uh, we want to look at your process conditions as well because uh, at times we've seen where uh, the customers might give us the information on their gas fired uh, heating equipment and and then we come back and uh, we we see the size of it and we run our calculations and it's not based on absorbed heat so electric heaters are based our size based on absorbed heat with with some safety factor uh, uh, designed in, in them as well but basically, electric resistive heaters, whatever power you're getting into, you put into it is because it's a, it's a constant resistance wire and due to Ohm's law, whatever power you're getting into it, uh, voltage power you're providing it is you're going to get the KW out. Uh, the, the same amount of KW based on Ohm's law. So I think, Thomas, you had maybe more to offer. No, no, it's just uh, the, the, the main thing is you can often get by with a, a smaller electric heater because of all those things you mentioned. So, you know, if it would, if it ended up being a megawatt fired heater, you might only need 800 kilowatts of electric heater. So your meter is not going to spin as fast as your gas. Your electric meter won't spin as fast as your gas meter. So you, you kind of just want to consider your, your, the thermal input input of the application, not necessarily the burner that's installed. Right, we want to look That's at exactly what, right. what the process is. We don't want to quote a heater just to re replace a, a certain duty fire heater, electric heater to replace a fire heater. We, we rather look at the process, do the calculations as far as what the heat duty uh, should be to get the input into the process fluids. Well, and that kind of segues into the next question. Um, you mentioned uh, calculator tools and de detailed quotes. I, I believe Thomas did earlier uh, as well, if I remember right. Um, in those calculator tools, that, that would include scope one, scope two, as you mentioned previously, and equipment costs, not the, not the heater, but we'll say the, the uh, ancillary products to run the heater. I mean, can, can that be considered and, and who to contact? And I guess that's pretty obvious from the screen. Yeah, you could contact your local sales support. They know how to get a hold of us and uh, or us directly. And uh, yes, we have uh, lots of tools in development and we'd love to get feedback on all of them for uh, almost any project you might have uh, to compare the numbers because it's a it's a it's a fast paced evolution going on right now, uh, re reducing all of these emissions. And um, and there's a lot of factors at play, as you were alluding to with the uh, you know, not just what the cost of the equipment is, what the cost of the permitting is. And, the, and then there's also a whole lot of other maintenance stuff as well as installation. Whereas if you were had to replace a, a fired heater, 
anyway, uh, you might have a lot less installation and get some landscape, uh, some, some space back because typically electric heaters are smaller physically than fire heaters. Uh, and then that might give you, you know, space for other, other uh, things you need in your facility. That's a good point, Thomas. I mean, and you know as well as I do, I, I've seen that it goes a factor of almost a, a fourth of the footprint of, of gas fired units uh, in some cases. Um, yeah, that was one of my favorite site visits. Uh, I won't say where, but uh, they they were there was people objecting to getting rid of fired boilers, putting in electric boilers. It was a, a oil refinery type facility. And and they they were saying uh, they only had a little slab for us to put the electric boiler. And we, when we walked out to look at it, we were saying, yeah, we can make you fit there. And then we're like, oh, by the way, both of your fire boilers are shut down. There was like six people shoveling soot out the bottom of it, you know, and it was uh, at least six times larger than what they were giving us space wise to put an electric boiler. Oh, wow. Okay, very good. Um, it, it, time for one more question. It just came in, um, and this pertains to the the uh, state regulations. Uh, do we have a, a list of states or regions that are taking part in state or federal incentive programs in DT for the DTS controllers? Uh, actually, I, in, in obviously Thomas and Dean, you can answer too. But I, I, I know of three states that are. Um, so I mean, the answer is yes. Uh, I know here in Colorado, that's that's definitely one, um, and then uh, two in the the western uh, states as well. He, honestly, that website that's on the the uh, slide uh, points you, and there's, gosh, I don't remember when we looked at it, Thomas. It, there's anywhere from fifty to a hundred different incentives in each state, uh, not all of them pertaining to say electric heat, but they're all decarbonization efforts, and then the rebates and stuff you have to either apply for or qualify for, but I can tell you, at least on my end, I helped, uh, you know, write one in my area, and, and I'm sure Thomas Dean, you guys have started to get a lot of that lately too, with our focus uh, on decarbonization. I'll let you speak. Sorry. <laughs> Thomas, hey, Derek. Dean. Yeah, Derek. If I mean, yeah, I mean, I, my advice right now is to you know go to this site and and to see if if your if your state. Um, is offering these these rebates. I mean, is that something you want to contact your Chromalox uh, uh, representative? Uh, we'll be happy to to do the research for you on that. But like you said, uh, I mean, some states are doing it, some states aren't. Um, you know, so uh, the other side of it is is that if you're looking at uh, you know if you you know why you're looking at this particular type of application, um, maybe there's some other type of applications for other. Uh, gas fired units uh you know within your facility um again th this is this is small impacts uh uh but they do add up to to larger impacts so you know one of the things that we do get is um you know we get the facility people calling us you know asking us you know how how am i gonna you know i'm, I'm told i have to decarb i i need to electrify and i, I don't know where to start well this is a place to start with the with the with the small impact side of it and of course you know we call it a thermal audit so we're happy to help you out with with your with your ther thermal audit if you would so um in case any anybody in case anybody couldn't read that slide uh just go to energy.gov and then there's a list of initiatives and then the eere you know the the committees and all of that type of stuff talking about the efficiencies uh, and all of that, all of that kind of stuff, and that's a good launch site to get into all of the other programs. Excellent. And, and what was that site again, Thomas? Energy.gov is a good starting point. That's an easy one to remember. Okay. Um, great. Uh, well, we. We, we thank everybody for attending. Uh, we're we're kind of getting to the end of the hour. So uh, uh, Dean, Thomas, uh, great job as usual and, and really appreciate you walking through that with us. Uh, for everyone else on the call, our contact information is right there. Uh, you're welcome to reach out uh, with any other questions or, or thoughts uh, after the presentation. It'll be available for everyone on our, our YouTube site if you need to go back and review it. And um, yeah, uh, again, Dean, Thomas, great job. And I will 
let everyone go. Thanks for hosting, Derek. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks for hosting, Derek. Yeah, thanks for attending, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.